much. What I'd like to do is something uh, a little different right now for a moment, and that is invite uh, Kendra Obrich, a nuclear expert from the um, uh, Friends of the Earth organization, for about five minutes. And then I want the panelists to be thinking about either things we want to add or or, or, or questions we may have of each other, etc. And then right around uh, you know 11:30 uh, ish or so, 11:35, we'll open it up to uh, members of um, of the audience. I am particular. There's a lot of press here that have questions. So please let's welcome uh, Kendra Olbrich, our nuclear expert from Friends of the Earth. Thank you for that introduction, Mayor, and uh, distinguished members of the panel. It is an absolute honor to be here. Uh, Prime Minister Khan, um, our deepest appreciation uh, for your coming to Southern California, sharing these experiences with community members um, that are directly impacted by their own nuclear threat. Um, on a personal note, I just want to say that for my colleague, Sean Burney, who spent 20 years fighting nuclear energy in Japan, um, he is deeply honored and Friends of the Earth is deeply honored. Uh, to have you here, so thank you. I just want to say a few words about the current situation at San Onofre, and uh, I will be up here afterwards uh, to answer any questions about what's going on currently with these reactors. Um, as my colleague Arnie Gunderson uh, pointed out, um, this is a nuclear experiment with Southern California. Uh, we are talking about radically redesigned critical equipment in the San Onofre reactors that is defective and failed a year and less than two years respectively after being installed. Southern California Edison installed this equipment without going through the proper licensing process that would have likely caught these critical design defects that unnecessarily placed the lives and livelihoods of 8.7 million people living within 50 miles of San Onofre at unnecessary risk. Um, Friends of the Earth has been challenging the NRC to hold them accountable and to hold Southern California Edison accountable to ensuring safety now, to go back and do the right thing. Last year in June, almost this time, we brought a contention to the NRC that argued not only did Southern California Edison need license amendments for restart or for uh, the replacement steam generators, but they also needed to go through this process uh, in order to be able to restart either reactor. At that time, we didn't know the extent of the damage. We weren't aware. We knew that there were major design changes. We knew that there were critical problems. We knew that there was a radiation release, an unprecedented tube damage. Um, I know that steam generator tubes are a little bit in the weeds for a lot of people. Um, and not the most exciting subject as our license amendments. However, it's so important to understand that these uh, pieces of equipment and the steam generator tubes provide a critical radiation barrier to protect the public. And if there is more than one tube failure, as Arnie said, this could provide or um, release a large amount of radiation into the environment, um, again, placing the public at unnecessary risk. So this is a very critical issue for the safety of Southern California Edison, or the safety of Southern California. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that too, that too, yeah, <laughs> and Edison. Um, so we've been working very, very hard uh, to ensure that these reactors are kept offline. Uh, we've been very successful in that. And uh, recently we won a stunning victory before the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board. Uh, this was the NRC's own board that the NRC commissioners voted unanimously to institute to consider the contentions that Friends of the Earth had brought that the process by which Edison is going through to restart these reactors is in fact a de facto license amendment process. What that means is that they would have allowed the restart outside of the scope of the operating license without allowing the public the opportunity for thorough independent vetting by independent experts like Arnie Gunderson, like uh, John Large, who is one of our nuclear consultants as well. 
And that is critical for ensuring safety, and we're seeing that today, again, because Edison avoided this process before critical design problems were not caught, and we absolutely cannot allow that to happen again. What the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board said very clearly after evaluating the merits, the actual facts, was that this restart proposal is an experiment, that the problems in Unit 2 and Unit 3 are the same, and that a hearing should take place before any restart is allowed. And I want to reiterate again, that was a stunning victory, not just for Friends of the Earth, but for everybody living near these reactors and near this nuclear threat. Southern California Edison wants to restart these without having a empirical database on which to base it. So what they're proposing is a theory. They have a hypothesis that they can control the tube degradation and they want to restart it for a trial run, shut it down, and see what happened. That is the definition of an experiment, when you test a hypothesis and then take a look and see what happened. We are saying that we absolutely will not allow uh, Southern California Edison to turn Southern California into a nuclear experiment. <laughs> And I think what was so incredibly powerful today, as Mr. Khan was speaking, was the impact that such a technology can have on a society. Here in Southern California, it's not just the people that are living near these reactors, millions of people, two of the largest cities in the country, and certainly in the state, that are jeopardized by this. But we also have the Port of Los Angeles. The economic impact, if something were to happen to the port, could be catastrophic, not just for California, but for the entire country. So with that, I want to thank all of you for coming today. Again, thank you so much to everybody on this panel, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, about the current situation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kendra. What I'd like to do now is please you know, remain here on the, on the panel with us. Let's just go into a little bit of a discussion. Um, in particular, uh, uh, our Prime Minister Khan, if there's anything you would like to add after all that uh, you have uh, heard, anything you'd like to comment, and any other panelists, if you would like to uh, add any comment or have a little bit of discussion, uh, please do so. And then in about 20, 30 minutes or so, we'll take uh, uh, questions from uh, the audience. So uh, if we may start with you, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, if you have any comment, please. え、3.11の事故の後、ワークミでも、ワークミ after 311, the big issue in my, in my administration and even after I resigned was, are we going to restart uh, 20, 27, immediately 27 reactors were stopped. And, and the big debate in the administration, even after I resigned, was what are we going to do with restart of all the others? 3.11 before 311, we had the Atomic Safety Commission, and all of these decisions were left up to solely that commission. しかし but this NISA uh, nuclear, excuse me, nuclear industry safety commission is now criticized as inappropriate. Used to, it was used to used to be an inappropriate group. Can you restate that, please? The, but now the nuclear 
NISA, it's NISA. the N-I-S-A, so it's the nuclear, been has been criticized for all of these um, decisions because they're, they're made in an insular environment and there is no transparency. And so he's connecting this to exactly uh, the issue of transparency and the issues that we're talking about with the NRC, Edison, and regulatory issues. で、事故の後私が使用して、え、再稼働する場合の条件をその after 311, the whole issue of restart was it was the very first hurdle for him personally. It was the hardest hurdle to actually rethink his uh, his philosophy on nuclear because as he mentioned before, everything had changed 180%. So this was the hurdle in his career. The first and most important part was the stress test for these reactors. We need to figure out a way. How can we test them for stress? And as you're doing such tests on the reactors, the most important part is the connection to the safety commission and regulatory agencies, open, having an open dialogue and an open, transparent uh, conduit and conversation. And thirdly, uh, having local support and the conversation with the local people that are affected by these issues. Local municipalities, pardon me. Okay. And, and finally, because of the first three, uh, the first three points, we needed to create a four-person commission to implement all of these issues so that there would be an open dialogue between. それ以降、今日までその波動を超えたのは野田内閣の時の多いの二つの原発だけで。and because of the creation of such of opening this four person this four armed commission and opening such a conversation we have overcome the hurdle and as a result presently we only have OE OE nuclear power plant as well as Monju reprocessing, reprocessing power plant only those two oh not Monju OE and two OE has two uh, reactors, pardon me. The Genzaiwa, Ano, Genshu Ganzen, In, Etistre, Genshu Ganzen, Huain, O, O, Zembu, Nakshimaste, Atarashi, Genshu, Kisein, Kayo, Tsukimasta. As a result, the old, the old. The old NISA that we were talking about, the old safety commission has been abolished and a new, as a result of overcoming this hurdle, a new regulatory uh, commission, safety commission, has been established. Nuclear Regulatory Authority is the English translation. And this year in April, we have the new rules that are coming from this uh, nuclear regulatory authority. ですから、これからワークリンでも再稼働を認めるかどうか、あるいは原発の新設を認めるかどうかは、この新しいルールに基づいて、まずは規制委員会が技術的な点で判断すると。and, and therefore, any questions that are regarding to restart or uh, construction of any new nuclear power plants will have to go directly uh, through the nuclear regulatory authority, this new created uh, entity. Uh, 
、えー、活断層といった断層がサイトの中にあるということで、えー、再稼働の申請そのものに対して、審査をしないという、出されても審査をしないという姿勢を示しています。So, what's really, really important about the direction from now on is doing more research about the active faults.、Uh, many of these plants are placed on or near active faults, and so we need to do more testing, and this is going to become a critical element of the decision making process for restart. There should be no nuclear plants obviously created there. しかし、昨年の12月の総選挙で、えー、自民党の政権に、えー、また変わったああ後は、えー、安倍総理を含めて、えー、再稼働をさせ,るさせたいということで、この委員会に圧力をかけていると、そのように私にはあの受け止めら、受け止め、Unfortunately, with December, the last election in Japan in December, we have a new administration, the Liberal Democratic Party, that Abe Prime Minister is leading. He is putting exceptional pressure on this nuclear regulatory authority, and it's just very, very, it's a very, very unfortunate situation for me to watch. And that's where I am、uh, viewing this situation. And I join you in putting all pressure against this nuclear regulatory authority. I join you in solidarity with your efforts, what you're doing here. We're in the same boat. Any other? Uh, uh, please go ahead, Commissioner, the, the courageous、uh, Commissioner. No, I, I,、uh, you know, I wanted to comment. I think it was an interesting point that Peter raised, and it, it, is, it, it is one of those issues I think that, that、um, certainly、uh, looking back is, I would say, almost stunning.、Uh, Is that we did not take any action at, at plants in the United States.、Uh, and there was very much pressure、uh, on the NRC to treat this as a Japanese accident.、Uh, and as a result, it, it was very, very difficult.、Uh, I recall a few conversations where I, I tried to broach the topic of. Even just a halt on licensing actions. And there really was, you know, within the commission, and, and a lot of it comes from the congressional pressure that, that、uh, Peter talked about, there was really not even an, a willingness to discuss a, a moratorium on, on licensing.、Um, and you know, the number of BW plants,、uh, you know, perhaps this weighs in favor of, of the action, the number of BW plants in the United States is fewer than the number of. Mark I uh, uh, BWRs in, in the United States.、Uh, so perhaps it was, you know, that may have weighed in to some degree. But,、um, but it is a fascinating fact to look back and, and see、uh, that you know, we really took, there was no direct impact on any U.S. facility following the action.、Uh, and um, and uh, there are plants. Likely, well, not likely, but、I'm, well, I would say likely because I don't know for sure. But say after the bombing in Boston,、uh, most nuclear power plants in this country took additional security measures.、Uh, that's standard process and protocol. Yet after the largest accident involving Western or U.S. essentially based technologies, there was not one single immediate action for any nuclear power plant in this country.、Uh, and,、uh, you know, it is one of those things that when you're in the middle of it, it's. You know, it's, it's difficult to process to some extent what that means, but it, it is, I think, a very, very interesting fact that, that he brought up. And, had, and until he had said it, it, it refreshed some memory of it. We did look at it and know that the talk, some what commissioners were telling me at the time was, well, what, 
what did the NRC do after Chernobyl? I mean, that was what really people looked at. What did we do after Chernobyl? Because it was a plant in another country. But Chernobyl technology was very, very different technology from U.S. technology. Um, and uh, you know, and, and there wasn't as much thinking. Well, what you know, what happened after Three Mile Island? And um, so it, I think it was a very interesting. And in, in, as I know, Prime Minister Khan has talked about. Um, the idea that has come out of other reports in Japan is this idea of the nuclear village. So it's a strong connection between the industry, the regulatory agencies, the government. Uh, and, and that connection exists in the United States to, to, to some degree, perhaps not to the extent in Japan, but it, it exists. Uh, and uh, so there, you know, there are more parallels, I think, with the accident in, in Fukushima with the United States than initially I think people wanted to acknowledge. And um, so I, I hope as we go forward, people will continue to, to reinforce that. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gunderson. Any any thoughts? How many of uh, the different reactors do we have here in the U.S.? Because you predicted, or you said that there, if there was going to be an accident, you could predict the likely areas. What do you see here? The uh, Mark One design um, was built by General Electric right up in San Jose. And um, it was designed by Ebasco in Manhattan. Um, and it was a turnkey project, which means that General Electric and Ebasco did fixed price projects. So Daiichi Unit 1 was um, all of the, the elevation, the 10 meter uh, distance above the sea, the seismic criteria, all of that was determined not in Japan. It was an entirely American-designed um, system, um, largely in California, where um, I frequently was in San Jose back back in the day. Um, we are. It's hard to put luck and Fukushima Daiichi in the same sentence, um, but. The, the, the Japanese and the, the, the Western Hemisphere are extraordinarily lucky that the earthquake occurred at 2 o'clock in the afternoon instead of 2 o'clock at night. If the accident had happened 12 hours later, there would not have been 1,000 people at Daiichi to fight it. There would have been 100. And the people that were off-site could not have gotten into the site to help because the infrastructure had collapsed. Uh, we would likely have had um, 13 meltdowns and not three. Um, of the plants along the Pacific, Daiichi, Daini, Anagawa, and Tokai, um, there were 37 diesels, 24 failed because of the tsunami. So the tsunami didn't just affect Daiichi, it affected Daini, Anagawa, and, and Tokai. Um, so um, when uh, we, can, we can thank our lucky stars that there were enough people, enough brave people at those sites who, um, who stayed behind and fought, um, uh, who fought a dragon they could not see for, um, for weeks to get these reactors under control. Um, I, I believe the world owes them uh, the, those several thousand people who stayed behind. And, and Prime Minister Khan for, for facing down Tokyo Electric, um, we owe those people uh, a great debt of gratitude. Thank you. This, uh, I'm Abby Sewell with the Los Angeles Times. This question's for Dr. Yasko. I think a year ago or so, when the issues were first starting to surface at San Onofre, you'd made a comment that you thought the NRC might need to revisit its processes for how it reviews these types of equipment changes and design changes under the 5059 process. What's what's your thinking on that now? Well, I don't think it's really changed. I, I think clearly at that, that, that time, we were still uh, 
as I recall, reviewing whether or not the steam generator replacement was properly done under 5059 uh, as, as 5059 was envisioned. And, uh, and there's, to, to some degree, there's probably debate about that question. But uh, I think from the agency's conclusion was that, that some things could be done under 5059. And I think at the time, my view was, well, if that turns out to be the case, we probably need to change 5059. Because I think if you look at this from the perspective, just with a blank slate, should a major equipment modification like a steam generator replacement be done without a license amendment, I think the answer would be no. And, and I think, quite frankly, you know, although I don't think Edison Electric would say it today, but if, if this had happened at another plant, I bet Edison Electric would be saying, yeah, we agree because, uh, and even maybe Arnie would agree with me that there would have been a better chance. Maybe it's not clear that the NRC would have caught the design changes and, and what the consequences would be, but there would have been a better chance that somebody would have. And quite frankly, that's in, 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 in San Onofre's, would have been in their best interest because no matter what, they have plants that are not operating and that's cost them a lot of money. So, um, you know, I, I think clearly that that's not, a major modification like this is not really what, um, what, what, you know, really is intended under 5059, and um, and uh, yeah, and clearly the consequences of it are, are such that, that that's self-evident. I think at this point, so you know, I think that does definitely need to be looked at and uh, and something that should be changed. Gotcha. And um, what's your sense at this point as to whether or not Edison did follow the 5059 process? You know, I, I have not followed it close enough to, to give you uh, an assessment. There's going to be a lot of a lot of people. A lot of people are going to be looking to answer that question uh, and, and and get a definitive answer. I think the NRC is doing investigations. Um, certainly, uh, depending on how the public hearing works out, that issue may be litigated there and may be litigated in, in federal court. So I, I think the jury's out on what the the real answer. Will be, but bottom line, I, I think it should not be a debatable question whether such a large component replacement it should not be allowed to be done under 5059. It should require a license amendment. Gotcha. Thank you. Or some review by the NRC, I should say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and thanks for the answers. Let's go to the next uh, speaker, please. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. Uh, Why don't you just raise the mic? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Morgan Lee with the uh, UT San Diego paper. I had a question for the Prime Minister, and I just wonder uh, what advice he would have as Southern California evaluates the situation here at San Onofre, given what he knows about um, uh, public government regulatory and, and uh, corporate communications. あの、um, all of the processes we're talking about 5059 all of these rules and processes and the way the regulatory uh, agencies work vis-a-vis -vis San Onofre he doesn't know that he doesn't know those details so However, it's two things in his view are very, very important and, and uh, that I need to say about our movement. The first one is when accidents happen, the impacts are huge. And it's not just that risk that we need to think about. It's not just the people, it's not just the displacement, it's the economic devastation. もう
この点を明確にする必要があると思います。Okay. And another thing that's very important for us all to really, really look at is that electric companies discuss the economic merits of nuclear power. However, these economic merits are primarily the electric companies' economic merits.、Yeah. It is, it's, Very important to understand that these economic merits are not passed on to the people. 原発を稼働させれば必ず使用済み燃料核,核廃棄物が新たに生まれます。その新たに生まれる核廃棄物の処理の費用まで含めて考えれば、私はあのどこの原発でもこれはアメリカあるいはこの。三王の船に限らずどこの原発でも早くストップさせた方がトータルのコストは低くなるとこのように考えてます。And the, the cost that is not figured into or calculated into the economic merit picture is the cost of, of、um, keeping this nuclear waste, protecting this nuclear waste from further、uh, leaking, from further problems.、Um, this cost、uh, that is bared is not, th- is not figured into a, a present cost analysis benefit, it is always carried forward, forward to future governments, forward to the future generations. And this is something that we really, really need to take a look at the cost of nuclear waste. And we need to stop it. The faster we can deal with this issue of cost, and w- the faster we can stop creating more waste, the lower the cost will be. Hi, I'm Ben Bergman with、uh, KPCC, and I have a question for Dr. Jaxo.、Um, you spoke very broadly about the U.S. nuclear industry and how reactors, there's a lot of aging reactors whose life should not be prolonged. And I'm curious, would you include San Onofre in that category? And you also spoke broadly about plants not adopting、um, you know, lessons from、uh, Fukushima. Could you apply that specifically to San Onofre? Um, on San Onofre, I,、uh, on the second part of your question, I'd just say I can't really comment because I just haven't followed close e n o u g h where they are with, with、uh, a lot of the Fukushima upgrades. They are not BWR designs,、uh, it's a different type of design, so some of the requirements wouldn't affect them. But,、uh, you know, I, and I think Peter touched on it there. You know, as, as we look at, at, at plants, the, there was a conscious decision by the NRC、uh, in the, in the, seven, in the、uh, mid 90s to,、um, to make a process of license extension that would be focused、uh, very narrowly on what it really referred to as aging management issues. So,、uh, in essence, the, the basic overall safety of a plant was assumed, and then you would look at impacts from aging、uh, on, on those facilities.、Um, You know, I think the, that accomplished largely what it was intended to do, or maybe not what it was intended to do, but it accomplished the relatively straightforward license extensions for most nuclear power plants in this country.、Um, the, there are some plants for which it has been a more contentious and, and more challenging process、um, because some plants have some unique characteristics that have led to public hearings and other things. But, You know, in, in general, I, I think the reality is we're generally dealing with old technology. I mean, you know, if you look at the Mark I's, I mean, this is very old technology. I mean, there have been retrofits and upgrades to some extent, but the basic design ideas are still many, many decades old. And,、um, you know, to some extent, it, 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 you know, I, I think to a large degree, yet、yeah, we'd be in a better place if we were replacing those with something else.、Um, but you, you can't do that overnight. Quite frankly, it's just, it's just not practical.、Um, so it may take decades and, and you know, may take five years, ten years, or, or whatever. But、um, the, you know, to a large extent, that is happening on its own. I mean, as Peter mentioned, Kiwani、uh, is now closed、uh, or will close. Uh, uh, you look at Oyster Creek, which is a plant in、um, New Jersey. They were given a license ex- extension for 20 years because of a host of economic factors. They decided that they would shut down,、uh, plan to shut down before they. Went through their full、um, extended period of license.、Uh, you have Crystal River, which was in the midst of a license extension process.、Uh, and interestingly enough, when I was chairman, they came to me and wanted that license extension process to continue and complete before they made a decision about whether they were going to make repairs to their containment structure.、Um, 
No, I said no. I said you need to decide whether you're going to repair it first, and if you can repair it successfully, then we'll talk about license extension. And they've now decided they don't want to basically risk $3 billion on the likelihood that it may not ever be repaired properly. Um, so, you know, when you look at a lot of plants, you're seeing now, I think, that the impacts of aging are showing up uh, in a way that is making them less viable uh, from an economic standpoint going forward, very much as, as Peter said. And, um, you know, I think that's just a, a reality. Um, and it, it, you know, it's probably telling us something that, you know, maybe there are better places to put our resources and dollars um, than in continuing to kind of um, maintain, a, a, you know, a, an aging and, and, and um, challenged infrastructure. But, but, I mean, just given that you haven't been following it closely, I mean, if do you think that San Onofre should be closed? Well, that's a separate question from, a, from the, you know, I, I think that I, I, right now, units two and three are shut down. Uh, and, um, you know, I honestly can't tell you if I just have not followed closely enough uh, you know, where, where they're going from here. Um, clearly, the tube degradation was a very... Um, surprising and unexpected phenomenon. Um, in a mature technology, that's not what you would expect. It's not what you should expect. Um, and I think more review at the time of the design, more review by the NRC would have been more likely to identify those challenges earlier. Um, but, uh, you know, at this point, it, it, it's largely, um, you know, it is largely in the situation it is, which is shut down pending the ability to um, to justify that, that it can continue to operate. And, um, you know, I think that's going to be a, a complicated and probably long drawn out process with a lot of, a lot of legal challenges and, and other issues uh, involved. Thank you. Mr. Gunderson wants to add a brief uh yeah, I promise less than a minute. Um, and the LA Times asked the question too. Um, they, there was a similar steam generator that ran through the NRC's 5059 process with a license amendment, and that was Palo Verde um, combustion reactors, roughly the same size. And the questions the NRC asked when they had the chance through the licensing process about fluid elastic instabilities, um, had those same questions been asked on Santa and Ofri, um, likely this problem would have been detected by the by the public participation process. Hi, I'm, I'm Morgan Cook with the Orange County Register, and I have a, cre a question for Dr. Yasko. And sorry. <laughs> um, so well, yeah, I got to hear your question before you apologize. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, in your professional opinion, uh, is there any way that San Onofre can restart? and operate safely with the existing infrastructure? Or do you think there would need to be significant technological changes, um, maybe not even necessarily restricted to the generators, but with how it handles and generates spent fuel? Um, well, I think, you know, I, I, I hate to answer these issues because quite frankly, I haven't been on the job for about a year and, um, and I haven't followed all these issues all that closely anymore. But I'll, I'll just say this. I think one of the last um, conversations I had before I left uh, with the management at, 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 on San Onofre was in regards to their essentially their modeling capabilities for the steam generator tubes. Um, and in my mind, the, the, the the burden of proof rests with San Onofre right now to demonstrate not only that their models can show that the plant will operate without degradation of the tubes, but that they can demonstrate confidence in the modeling. Because, of course, their modeling previously showed that, or you know, Mitsubishi's or the combination of modeling. So the, the issue right now is not only do you have to be able to prove that y y your models or that your models can get the answers you need, but that you can believe that the models are right. And that is a difficult problem. Uh, and, and I'm just looking at it kind of as an outsider now. The approach that's being taken is not one that instills tremendous confidence in me because the approach is for operation at reduced power. In principle, what you should see is design modifications and changes that allow operation at the license power levels. Um, when you're operating at reduced power levels, that indicates that there are still um, areas of challenge with those steam generators operating at, at you know at, at at higher power rates so 
in general, I think that, that there's that, that that just raises a lot of questions to 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 want to operate at seventy percent power, and and I think that's a fairly novel idea in, in to some extent within the NRC to to be looking at a, 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 you know. A, a, Allowing a plant to operate at reduced power levels because of a safety issue, and uh, you know plants operate at lower power levels for, I mean, to some extent for safety issues, but as a licensing matter to reduce the power level, it, it's in a way a very novel thing, and, and again, just leads me, you know, it, it would create doubt in my mind that that there's a complete understanding of, of all the phenomena that are at play here and and, uh, and what the impacts will be. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello, nice to meet you. My name is Jun Hori. I am a freelance journalist uh, from Japan. Uh, I would like to know uh, two questions. Uh, first, Mr. Khan, uh, why uh, you didn't expand the evacuation area from the reactor uh, because government, U.S. government uh, decided uh, 50 miles from the reactor. Uh, and the government uh, covered up the information about the meltdown. Uh, I would like to about me what? Mel meltdown. meltdown. The information about the meltdown. Uh, so I would like to know the reason of your determined. And the next, uh, Yatsuko, uh, Mr. Yatsuko, uh, what do you think about his determined? Yeah. This is my question. Thank you. When, when, when thinking about the evacuation area, how large will the evacuation area be, I needed to think about two things. The first one is talking about the exposure, the dangers of the actual exposures. What were the actual exposures and what were those dangers? That's one thing I had to consider. So he's, let me, let me uh, qualify that, the supposed exposures. And in discussing these supposed exposures within a given evacuation range, he... Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, and we, after the, after the hydrogen explosions, he had to consult with specialists um, that dealt with this information. Semonka ni? Tatoeba no, Madaname, Genshu Ganze Hincho, Nato, no, Iken o Kite, Kemashita. For example, one of those, um, Watanabe, Watanabe was the. Madarame. Madarame, Madarame. <laughs> Madadame. Madadame, too. Um, he was the chief of the nuclear, nuclear safety. safety commission. So それには、あの、20キロから30キロ圏は送られたいというものを、あの、比較的早い段階で Mm. And as a result of his consulting with this chief of the nuclear commission, at first they just they talked about a five kilometer radiation evacuation. Then it went to ten, then it went to twenty, and finally only thirty kilometers evacuation zone. もう一つの観点は原発から放射性物質が外に出てそれが Okay, so and then he had to think about the actual radiation. What was the actual amount of radiation exposure that came out and what what would have been the influence? Of this radiation exposure, 
、まあ、これはあ,のあなたは日本人だからご存知でしょうがあのスピーディーといったソフトを使うことさらにはモニタリングをの結果をから判断すること、まあ、そういうことが。必要です。次第にそういったものを含めた判断をその先ほどの第一の判断と加えて、えー、一部拡大しをしましたアメリカからのこの50マイルというのはアメリカの在日本に,に在住している皆さんに対してそういう避難の指示が出たということは聞いておりますが我々自身あの日本政府としての判断はまあ、それも情報としては知ってましたけども今申し上げたような基準で、えー、専門家の意見を聞いて決めたということです。And so he knows very well about the orders from the U.S. consulate and the U.S. NRC to evacuate a 50 mile radius for all American nationals. And he, unfortunately, or, but his Japanese government, upon,、um, upon consulting with his experts, they decided otherwise. またもう一点、カンさん、今の部分で、あの避難範囲を広げると、東北自動車道が使えなくなって、宮城や岩手に物資が届けられなくなるからという、そういう範囲を広げたというのは、本当に。今回の件に関しては、本当に。それでは、それでは、それでは、それでは、それでは、それでは、それでは、それいろいろな情報をその発表しなかったのは何ですかあるいは隠したのではないかといった趣旨の質問でした。しかし私のところに入った情報で。何か都合が悪いからといってそれを隠した情報はあの一つもありません。However, the information that was given to him, all Japanese government officials, was not of the same information that he did not hide anything from, from his consultations with the inside government. それはあのスポークスマンを務めた官房長官、枝野官房長官も全く。同様だと言ってますし、私もそのことを信頼してます。And Edano, Edano from the, the Chief Secretary of Government, Edano,、um, also says the same thing, that they, they didn't hold any, any information back, and he stands by this. しかし、あの、プライムミニスターである私や、その、官房長官に上がってこない、情報がいろいろあったということはその後に、えー、次第に分かってきました。Unfortunately, even Edano, Chief Edano,、um, has agreed to this, and we know that other information was presented after the decisions were made. And so. Let, let me interfere if he's almost done, because we're almost、yeah. out of time. I'm going to extend it to 12:15,、okay. but maybe、yeah. we can speed the whole thing、yeah. up a little bit. まあそういった意味であの、うん、スピーディーもその例ですが、決してあの私はその官房長官が知ったことを隠したということはありません。うん、And the information that he did receive from Speedy, there's all sorts of talk that he, it wasn't released. It, what, this is the information that he got. And so he stands by the decision made at that time. The other information came out afterward, and that's the, 
that's the crux. All right. Libby Halevi, nuclear hot seat. And I was one mile from Three Mile Island when the accident happened there. So, Mr. Bradford, I'm appreciative of you bringing up the human aspect that of that issue. And that is the focus of this question. It is for Mr. Bradford, Mr. Yasko, and Prime Minister Khan. If you found yourself on the ground in close proximity to a nuclear reactor having a major accident, perhaps with members of your loved ones, your close family with you at the time, what would your reaction be, not as a person in authority, but as a person at the affect of the authority of people such as you once were? What would your personal response be? And what would you want the response to be of those people who held those positions of authority? I hate, always hate to say it depends, but to some extent it does depend on what the immediate prospects are in terms of radiation releases, uh, uh, where I am in relation to where the wind is uh, blowing. Uh, my fundamental impulse would be to get further away. Uh, and I can't add much to what I said earlier about hoping that the people issuing the advisories in uh, at the Washington end were thinking about that reactor as though they had lived within a few miles of it and knew a lot of people, um, and not just in the abstract or about their possible next job in the nuclear industry. Well, I, you know, just to follow on what Peter said, I mean, I, my first reaction would be to follow the advice of local officials. I mean, that, that is, you know, in, a, in an evacuation, that's who you're you're going to be listening to, and that's who you want people to listen to. It's going to be the sheriff. It's going to be the local police, uh, and that is extremely important because you, if people don't follow those recommendations you have more chaos, which can be more difficult to deal with than, um, than if you don't. So the, the challenge is building and, and ensuring that trust before you have the accident, before you have the incident, so that when, when it does happen, that people do feel confident to follow those, those recommendations. And um, you know, the 50-mile the decision in, in, uh, in Japan was, came from the NRC staff. We had different technical information. We were getting different information, and, and so we went forward with what we thought was appropriate for Americans, not for all the people in Japan. We knew there was a small number of Americans who lived uh, around the plant in, in Fukushima, so we could take a different kind of action because we weren't ordering evacuations, we weren't doing any of those kinds of things. It was effectively a travel advisory. I mean, that was really the, the extent to say Americans should avoid this area, much like the State Department issues travel advisories for places that may have disease outbreaks to avoid an area because of, of things like that. So it was doing a different thing, but it, you know, it reinforced to me that at the crunch time, the people in the NRC who were making those decisions were making the decision based on what the technical data showed and what the right thing to do was to protect people. And, and you know, we did that. And it was not without, we knew it was going to be difficult because it was different from what the Japanese government was saying. Um, but that's what we thought was the right thing to do. And, and, and so we did it. Mr. Prime Minister. あ、私は If I was not prime minister and I was just like every suffering person waiting for instructions, I would want correct information from my government. まあ、それに従って、あの、警察やそういう指示に従って、え、行動するというのが一番の原則だと考えます。And the first premise, the most important premise is to be able to follow what the what the authorities, what the law enforcement authorities and any other agencies are advising you to do. しかし、あの、同時に長期にわたる 
あの低い線量の被爆に対する対応としては場合によっては妊婦子供を産む女性や小さい子供に対しては個別に判断をして、えー、優先的に避難をするというそういう判断も場合によってはあのしたかもしれません。However, And this is very important. When we're talking about low dose exposure from radio, radioactive exposure,、um, the most important thing to think about is the pregnant women, women,、uh, and children, and how to create your.、Um, We really need to think about that when we create our priorities for who is evacuated first, because this low dose exposure is a very, very important issue, and this is also depending on that low dose exposure. Thank you. Arigato. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. John Lightning, DAB safety team. There's a lot of heroes in this room, and I salute you all.、Uh, I'd like to talk about nuclear risk. Nuclear risk is something that the people that live around these plants can do nothing about because they're not decision makers. So I would like to hear from each of you how we can transfer this risk to the utilities that run these reactors. Because unless they are at risk, they don't care. Uh, using uh, TEPCO as an example, after Fujishima, sure their stock price went way down, but the Japanese government bailed them out, and they're going to make a huge profit on the decommissioning of those reactors. You just get us a question because we've、right. got to keep moving. So the moving. question is, how do we best transfer the risk? To the utilities and take it off the backs of the people that live near the plants. Well, I mean, I, I think one, you have you have to be involved and you have to、um, you have to engage your elected officials. That's probably the most significant、uh, thing that you can do、um, because the system starts there. And、um, you know, if you look at the NRC, the NRC is a, is a commission made up of five members who are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate.、Um, and、uh, I mean, you're. Fortunate here, you have two very strong senators, and Senator Feinstein and Senator Boxer, who I think are very engaged on on the San Onofre issues, and and I think are very、um, powerful and effective voices on on that issue. But、um, that that is the most probably effective way that you can help、uh, ensure that there is appropriate risk sharing and、uh, um, is engaging the elected officials who appoint the government officials, whether at the state or the federal level, that ultimately make the decisions that affect these facilities. Thank you. Just keep it short and ask it of one person. Please go ahead, sir. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Jess Lopez Arambula. I'm a registered nuclear engineer, <clears throat> retired. I have spent my entire professional career in the nuclear industry, in the uh, with uh, with uh, with a faith uh, that uh, was unchallenged. Uh, I was born in Nevada, and、uh, I witnessed、uh, atomic bombs. Be、uh, I, I was able to get up in the morning and look to the south. I was in, I was born in northeastern Nevada、uh, to see the glow of the atomic uh, uh, bomb being tested in Las Vegas.、Uh, That had a profound impression on me. I then went to the、uh, went, received my degree. Yes, and please、uh, give us a question. Yes, yes, I just want to say one thing. I then worked on the reactors for the for the first reactor on the Nautilus in Idaho, at the reactor testing station. I then came to Southern California, and worked for General Atomic on advanced. Nuclear reactors. Then I was also a an expert with the International Atomic Energy Agency, and I must say, I'm 80 years old, and I must say that this afternoon and this morning has been a waterfall for me personally, because I've had the opportunity of listening to Prime Minister Khan and this distinguished panel here. That has completely. I, I have been opposed to the restart of San Onofre on 
technical reasons. But I now can tell you that for the rest of my life, which I don't know how many years I have left, I will be, I'm completely opposed to nuclear power. I even, I even attended, I even was a member of the American Nuclear Society and was invited to the Kirchhoff Research Institute where they explained Chernobyl. So that's been my entire yes, life. Let me, let me thank you for your so testimony. I want, so I want to. And let's go to the next I question. I want to say thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Miki Bay. I'm living in Irvine, uh, 20 miles from the San Ofle. And si since Cassie is here, can I talk? I have a question. To, uh, you want to speak in Japanese? Can I do that? Can you translate in English yeah. real quick I'll for us? Quick. Just okay. do it simultaneous, please. Oh, of course. Go. 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 それはあの日本の美しい美しさだとかあと人々の優しさだとか文化の深さをいつも自分。Sorry, I'm losing my mind here. I'm sorry. So, um, yes, my life has been thrown upside down since 311. Everything, the fabric of my social uh, belief system, everything has just been turned upside down uh, as a result of 311 Fukushima disaster. そしてそれまでは日本のことを I was very, until then, I was so proud of Japan. It's uh, in my heart. And ever since the disaster, I look at how my government treats the children, how they treat their own people, and I have lost all hope. I'll be so quick. あの、あの、田本総理は Khan has um, before before three one one he was promoting nuclear power and he also said today he's very embarrassed of that. Okay. Right. And it's been two years, and there are tons of kids living in high exposure zones in Fukushima. Can you please uh, oh, okay, get okay. to the bottom? Okay. Go so, ahead. The what I want to talk about is that for the future, 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 and my question is not to the Prime Minister Khan, it's to the fabulous human being Khan. What can you do for these children? What is your plan to help these people suffering in Fukushima? He's, he has two main points that he'd like to address here. The first one is he wants to create a nuclear free Japan. That's what he wants to work toward. Uh and he wants to concentrate on Fukushima and put resources into taking care of these people. Thank you. Thank you. 
I want to thank all the folks from the audience, people from the press, and especially our panelists, our very distinguished thank panelists. So um, let's go on and have a good uh, rest of the day, and, and thank you all for being here, friends of the earth, our, our prime minister, our, our commissioners, and our, our experts. Thank you very much.